Hello, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I am delighted to introduce our uh, today's speaker, Professor Ronnie Poland, who is going to introduce the classical Judeo Arabic. Ronnie is professor of Judaic studies at the Ludwig Maximilian Univers University in Munich. He is currently the chairperson of the German Association of Jewish Studies. His teaching focuses on rabbinic Judaism and on the intellectual history of Jews in the Islamic world. He researches Arabic versions of the Bible, Judeo-Arabic literature, and Jewish cultural heritage. And above all, he works on medieval manuscripts. His publications include Arabic versions of the Pentateuch, a comparative study of Jewish, Christian and Muslim sources, which was published in Leiden in 2015. Ronnie, the Zoom screen is all yours, please. Uh, thank you very much for this uh, kind introduction. Uh, hello to everyone. Um, you meet me today in Munich. So I'm in Munich, here you see my office. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to speak to you about uh, Judeo Arabic tonight, and I hope that the connection is clear and you hear me well. So uh, if this is not the case, you could give me a signal. So uh, what will I talk about tonight? So I will speak as Judith has just introduced about classical Judeo Arabic. So I will not deal with the modern period. So things are slightly different, uh, quite a lot different in in modern times, and I will probably mostly concentrate on the written Judeo Arabic. So um, I will not touch at all the spoken varieties of uh, Judeo Arabic at all. Um, I will start with this short historical overview where I introduce like um, Judeo Arabic as a language in its larger um, historical context. Uh, I will speak a little bit about uh, the different periods that we have. I will speak about the problem of actually defining what Judeo Arabic is and I will um, eventually um, also speak about the um, question, question of script, so uh, that's an important question for Judeo Arabic. So, um, and finally, um, I will speak about the particular functions that I think um, Judeo Arabic literature had in uh, Jewish literature uh, very generally. So um, now let me start. So the uh, Islamicate Middle Ages witnessed uh, a ramified production of Jewish literature in the Arabic language. This particular branch of diasporic writing is hardly known, despite its formative significance in shaping medieval Jewish literary culture. Speaking of this literature, it may be defined as the writings composed in Arabic by Jewish authors concerned with topics of predominantly Jewish interest. But as we will see um, in this lecture also, attempting a definition is a thorny matter. Judeo Arabic um, holds a special place among Jewish literary and spoken vernacular of the post-Talmudic the post period. It has the longest recorded history and widest diffusion. Judeo Arabic was spoken by more people than any other Jewish language um, and it was the medium of the, four, of, of, of the foremost periods of Jewish cultural creativity. So let me now start with a short uh, historical introduction. Um, in the seventh and eighth century, centuries, the Muslim conquests of the Near East and subsequently also North Africa and the Iberian Peninsula transformed the cultural political tapestry uh, of the era uh, in its uh, essence. While the political setting changed entirely, late antique intellectual heritage found its continuation and became gradually acculturated into an Islamic society that was then in the constant process of constituting itself. In pre-Islamic Mesopotamia, uh, Jewish communities had numerically constituted a major fraction of uh, Sasanian society for many centuries and their internal affairs were mostly respected. Their renowned Jewish institutions, as for example, the Gaonat, the, the, Gaonat, the, the Gaonat and the, the, the religious leadership and the exilash, um, the exilashat, the leading political authority evolved under the protection of Sasanian rule. 
Sources lack as to how these communities perceived the change of their overlords and responded to the Sasanian defeat of the uh, Muslim armies in Hadesia in 636. In Palestine, the center, the other center of Jewish learning, the picture is different. Jews at large welcomed the Arabian tribesmen and possibly collaborated with them in overthrowing the previous rulers. During the Byzantine Sasanian Wars between um, 603 and 628, the Persians subdued a large part of the Byzantine East, Asia Minor, Syro, Palestine, and also Egypt. Um, this was exactly also the time uh, as um, when Muhammad started his prophetic career in the Hijaz, um, struggled with his own tribesmen, the Banu Quraysh, who had refused to accept his prophethood and forced him to migrate from his native um, Mecca to Yathrib, which um, henceforth became known as El Medina, the city of the prophet. The, Sassani the Sassanid armies gained control over Jerusalem only for a re relatively brief interlude. Ever since the defeat of Bar Kokhba in uh, 135, which had as a result that Jews were forbidden to enter Jerusalem, the gates of the cities reopened to them for the first time. What is more, the Persians installed a Jewish self-administration for a short while, much similar to the religious customs under their rule in uh, the Persian homeland for centuries. Byzantine forces, however, restored their rule in Palestine and the effect this had on the Jewish communities was very great indeed. Um, Jerusalem was recaptured in 628 in a military counter-strike by led uh, led by no other than the emperor Heraclius himself. He placed a heavy burden on the treacherous Jews in retaliation. Contemporaneous accounts report persecution, slaughter, and compulsory conversion. In the same year on the Arabian Peninsula, Muhammad embarked on a campaign towards Mecca. Uh, after being victorious, he soon prepared north northward offenses. Uh, the prophet of Islam did not witness the conquest of Palestine with his own eyes before he passed away. However, more concerted military operations were carried out by his heirs, the Caliph Abu Bakr and Omar uh, ibn al khattab The battle by the Yamuk River in 636, um, this is the same year as also Mesopotamia was subdued, um, marks the total overthrow uh, of Byzantine forces and is considered the beginning of Muslim rule in Syria, Palestine. So now this is kind of the historical background we are dealing with. With the end of the Umayyad um, period um, in 650, an estimated 90% of Jewish population lived under Muslim dominion. This led to two factors um, that also shaped the development of Judea. First, the Islamic expansion had not only for the first time in many centuries united the vast majority of the Jewish people in one single linguistic, cultural, and political uh, entity, but also inaugurated a period of great scholarly growth and an almost unparalleled uh, literary blossoming uh, among Jews. Several factors contributed to that. Their legal status had been quite comfortable uh, on the whole with occasional exceptions. Judaism, as well as Christianity and Zoroastrism, were accorded the status of licit religions. Ahl uh, al is the term used here in Arabic under Islam. On the whole, Jewish affairs prospered. Uh, in Iraq, the old centers of learning, the academies of Suva and Kumpedita, flourished, and by the turn of the ninth century, had moved to Baghdad, um, the uh, Abbasid's empire's political and intellectual capital. Palestine had its own competing uh, Gaonet um, and uh, also other new learned places, places appeared on the intellectual map, as for example, Fustad in Egypt, Kairouan in North Africa, as well as Cordoba and Toledo uh, on the Iberian Peninsula. Karaism sprang, out, uh, uh, sprang up in the middle of the ninth century in the Eastern peripheries of the Abbasid empire. A scripturalist movement to put it very 
uh, kind of simple, which rejected the authority of oral tradition as canonized in the different branches of rabbinic literature and upheld the uh, text of the Bible as the sole source for exegesis, Jewish prudence, and religious practice. The second biggest factor is that Arabic was adopted by non-Muslims for the most forms of spoken and written communication, even by those who maintain their bilingualism. So this process has to be taken strictly separate from the spread of Islam as a religion. It was more penetrating um, and it went faster. The Hebrew language remained restricted um, to liturgical poetry and later also secular poetry uh, and rhyme prose and correspondence. Its widespread use among Jewish communities, Arabic that is, uh, which exceeds um, that of all previous koinés can be attributed to the fact that it was accepted as an administrative, religious and cultural language to the same degree. Jews, Christian and Muslims, the educated elite, but also common people who much less uh, actively partook in the realm of intellectual high culture, naturally shared a similar cultural background, spoke, but also wrote the same language. This situation differs from that of Jews under Christian rule, where Jewish scholars were never part of Latin literacy. Yehuda ibn Tibon, who died in 1190, uh, who forced by persecution, had left his native Granada, Granada and settled down in uh, Christian Provence, uh, notes with some nostalgia, and I quote, most of the Geonim in the dispersion under the rule of Ishmael in Babylonia, Palestine and Persia were speaking Arabic. And likewise, all of the communities in those land um, were using the same tongue. Most of the commentaries they wrote on the Bible, the Mishnah, and the Talmud, they wrote in Arabic, as they similarly did with other works, as well as their responsa uh, for all the people understood that language. So here we hear some nostalgia of this uh, world of Judeo Arabic, basically. Under Muslim rules, Jews and Christian and Muslims read the same books, copied them, produced an ocean of commentaries on them texts, innovative literary models and forms of discourse, all being composed in what was then the lingua franca Arabic, could easily travel beyond communal uh, barriers. By virtue of this parag paradigmatic shift, a unifying Arabic literacy came into being that was encompassed both by Muslims and by non-Muslim writers. The stimulus it had on Jewish literature, whose characteristic structures had been forced in the classical rabbinic uh, corpus led to a number of innovations that were to set the literary model for later generations. And I will come back to that later. Arabic remained the main language of literature, of Jewish literature, well to the end of the Abbasid period. Um, um, following the 13th century, Hebrew started to gain ground again over Arabic as the almost preferred literary language, but not exclusively. Several factors contributed to that. First of all, um, the decline of the Geonic centers uh, of learning in Iraq and Palestine, who, which were traditionally a stronghold of Arabic, um, and the rise of Hispanic schools, um, which not only brought forth an elaborate literary production in Hebrew, but also fostered translations of the most central Jewish word, works um, in Arabic into Hebrew. With the expulsion from Spain, this preference uh, for Hebrew spread also uh, among uh, the Mediterranean shores. Um, and it also seems, and there's much to say about that, that this later preference for uh, Hebrew reflected a certain detachment from uh, Arabic culture starting from the uh, Mamluk period onwards. So to do Arabic, um, how can we define this language? Um, the term to do Arabic refers uh, both to a type of Arabic used by Jews, um, both in written and spoken forms and the literature produced therein. The written language, which shall concern us here only is far from being linguistically uniform. 
it is generally accepted to divide into three periods. That is early um, up to the 10th century. So that's the 9th and the 10th century. Classical, that's from the 10th to the 15th century. And late Judeo-Arabic, that's after the 15th century. Um, I will here also in this talk only cover early a little bit and also classical Judeo-Arabic. Um, Judeo-Arabic is a productive branch of what we call Middle Arabic, uh, namely uh, that stratum of post-classical Arabic that deviates from the prescriptive, prescriptive rules of classical Arabic grammar and mixes classical with vernacular elements. So now how can we define this language? Um, often a, a linguistic definition is brought um, and this li linguistic definition um, as for example, often proposed by the Jerusalem School of Judeo-Arabic Studies holds the belief that Judeo-Arabic is linguistically distinct from other non-Jewish branches of Arabic um, and is therefore often called a religious act. Uh, that's a term that is used recently mostly by uh, Benny Harry. A comparison, however, uh, to Jewish and Christian varieties of Middle Arabic exhibits more parallels than distinctions. So um, that is a definition that in itself will not do very well here. Used in a very narrow way, the term Judeo-Arabic designates the textual practice of writing Arabic in Hebrew letters. This is comparable to the allographic use of Greek and Syriac script um, for Arabic among medieval Christian communities. And as a matter of fact, um, Samaritan Arabic, uh, which uses Samaritan script. This narrow definition, however, based on graphic conventions, um, however, is also not unproblematic. It does, for example, exclude texts written by Jewish authors on Jewish topics for Jewish readership in Arabic script. And we will see examples of that. Um, it's very prominent, but not only in uh, among Karais. Um, further, it poses the question whether an Arabic text that became transcribed in Hebrew script, um, and also we see examples of that later, has to be subsumed under the category category Judeo-Arabic at all. So we will we will see that also this definition uh, is not really satisfying. But let me speak now a little bit about the spread of Arabic among uh, Jewish communities. Already long before the Muslim conquest, certain Jewish communities uh, used some form of Arabic as their vernacular. Most uh, of uh, the evidence with regard to this earliest period of Judeo Arabic is indirect and by no means infallible. In the areas settled by Arabian tribes, that is Southern Palestine and Transjordan, uh, uh, Jews employed an uh, Aramaic dialect um, that had apparently been heavily influenced by Arabic. Um, and um, this is actually called Aravit in uh, rabbinic literature. And rabbinic sources sometimes mention the uh, characteristics of this language. But also Jews on the Arabian Peninsula were fully emerged in an Arabic speaking uh, intellectual and political environment. Although a Jewish settlement looked back on a long lasting presence, um, even there before the advent of uh, Muhammad, their origins remain enigmatic. Epigraphic evidence in uh, Nabatine Aramaic or other, also other languages, but also Hebrew script uh, go back uh, far, um, as far as to the first century BCE. The Jews of Arabia appear to have been more or less fully uh, au courant with um, biblical and post-biblical um, rabbinic and Talmudic lore. The best illustration thereof is probably found in Muslim, uh, in the Muslim scriptures. Echoes of late antique Jewish but also Christian scriptural heritage and exegetical traditions can be found everywhere all so presently. Not only the unfolding Quranic revelation but also Muhammad's early followers demonstrate great familiarity with these traditions. What is more, Jews and that this is what we learn from these indirect sources were Tzitit uh, and Talitot um, the ritual fringes and uh, had side logs. 
Um, and we also have a handful of pre-Islamic graffiti um, in Judeo Arabic. Um, um, they indicate that actually on the Arabian Peninsula, the uh, Hebrew script was used productively. Um, early Muslims were familiar with the Hebrew script. Uh, it's called Kitabat al Yahud or Khat al Yahud. Um, and this even occurs in some pre Islamic poetry. Uh, the, the poet, for example, as Shamar, um, compares the footsteps of, uh, in the sand um, to be like um, dashed off by a Jewish scholar in Taima writing Hebrew with his right hand. So um, the, the, the knowledge of, of, of the Hebrew script uh, was actually known. For the early Islamic period, the Hadith and early traditional uh, literature furnishes many accounts of, the, of Muhammad's encounter with the Jewish tribes of Yathrib, um, uh, as well as uh, their most influential members and the names that are given here are Bin Khaz al-Yahudi, Sha'az ibn Qais, and above all Abdullah ibn Salam. There is also evidence that um, Jews employed a distinct Arabic dialect which incor incorporated some Hebrew and Aramaic loan words, um, especially in the domain of culture and religion. This dialect was called by Muslim authors El Yehudiya, so the Jewish language. Um, Although we have to say that no literary traces of this dialect have come down to us, um, and it almost certainly never served anything more than as an oral vehicle. Except for the very few uh, graffiti already mentioned above, uh, we have no written evidence uh, of uh, Judeo Arabic on the Arabian Peninsula. The Hebrew and the Aramaic uh, lexical uh, elements of the Jewish Arabic vernacular resurfaced um, as claimed by some scholars uh, in the Quran and also early Muslim literature. So parallel to the customary recital of the Aramaic Talgumim, Jews on the Arabian Peninsula were in the habit of translating the Hebrew scriptures. So now following the whales of the Muslim conquest, Arabic slowly became the lingua franca of the entire region and um, the spoken tongue of most of its non-Arabic inhabitants. Jewish communities, but also Christian communities in Iraq, Syria, Palestine, Egypt, and North Africa, as well as the Sam Samaritans in Palestine and elsewhere, adopted the language for most uh, written and spoken communication. Aramaic, Greek, Coptic, the three dominant languages, uh, before then were largely supplanted. For most of the communities, the older languages uh, became a scholastic medium that had to be learned and only continued to be used in the liturgy. This process, we can be sure, was a gradual one um, and the pace uh, at which this took place depended on the um, conquered population's political and social cultural contacts with the Arabic speaking elite. Urban centers, including the newly found Amsar, that's the garrison towns, uh, where uh, most of the Muslim chan chancelleries were located, doubtlessly played a catalyzing function in this process. The adoption of Arabic appears to be more inclusive and more rapid there. The, the Caliph Abdel Malik uh, inaugurated the use of Arabic for administrative purposes, a poli policy that was also continued uh, in the reign of his son, El Walid I. So the majorities of Jews um, in lands now under Muslim rule from Iraq to Al Andalus adopted the Arabic language in the course of the eighth and ninth centuries. In the fertile crescent, uh, Arabic gradually dis displaced uh, Aramaic, the Aramaic vernacular, initially in the larger centers, and the Jews began using it um, for everyday intercourse. This process, as uh, conjectured by Goitain, was connected to the transformation of the Jewish society from a rural to an urban one. Nevertheless, Haigaon, for example, still refers to remote villages still speaking Aramaic, uh, where it remained a vernacular until well into the modern period in some geographical pockets. Multilingualism seems to have retained, uh, remained the norm as it, by the way, also had been prior to the spread of Arabic. And um, what is also 
what is more, one must distinguish between different stratums of the Jewish population. In addition to Aramaic, Hebrew is, uh, was well understood and used by the educated. Um, governed by the necessity to enable their participation in liturgy, medieval Jewish culture possessed uh, highly formal methods of teaching, um, literacy, and the instruction of basic Hebrew reading skills to belong to the core curriculum for Jewish males. Active, fluent Hebrew must have been one of the hallmarks of high culture. The lesser learned population not always understood Hebrew. Now, let me turn to chronology. Um, the earliest attestation uh, of Judeo Arabic for writing, um, which we usually call early Judeo Arabic, um, is on papyrus, um, consisting of fragmentary documents and letters composed in the so called early phonetic Judeo Arabic script. Um, the fact that these texts are written on papyrus assures a terminus antiquem of circa 900 CE. And the interesting thing is that their orthography is virtually unaware of classical Arabic writing conventions. It is based entirely on Hebrew and Aramaic spelling conventions. It has been suggested that the scribes spoke Arabic but had no acquaintance with the written language. Most of the texts are of a documentary nature. Um, they deal actually a lot with business. And um, I would say that actually only a fraction so far of this Judeo Arabic papyri have actually been discovered and there's uh, much more to be found out about this. Additional fragments of this early phonetic Judeo Arabic script um, is preserved in the various Geniza collections. Um, and they come from different fields. So, for example, legal thought, exegesis, and also there's quite a number of Bible translations. But as a result of an increasing exposure to classical Arabic writing, most Judeo Arabic authors from the 10th century onwards adopted a standardized orthography that was molded by analogy to classical, um, classical Arabic orthography. Usually, um, it is the work of Sa'adia Ga'on that is considered by many as a pinnacle uh, of this development. And uh, usually with him, we somehow place the beginning of classical Judeo Arabic. Now, late, to the Arabic orthography that I will not speak about in length um, from the 15th century onwards, broke away from the ideal of classical Judeo Arabic orthography and also uh, classic uh, Arabic uh, of the uh, kind of the Muslim classical Arabic orthography and dissolved into uh, a distinct phonetic character. Um, now, um, let me come to the um, question of script. So the question of script is interesting here. Um, Jews commonly wrote Arabic in Hebrew letters, um, similar to other um, Jewish languages. This habit uh, followed the precedent set it by Jewish Aramaic, um, and further the use of Hebrew letters um, in the opinion of Yeshua Blau, for example, characterizes um, is a characterizing feature of Judeo Arabic as it clearly shows the barrier that separated the bulk of the Jewish population from Arabic and Islamic culture. Yet, we have to say, exceptions exist. Uh, first of all, we do know that Arabic was taught, um, I mean, Arabic script. So in the response on Baha'i Ga'on, um, it is stated that it was in fact permissible to teach the children Arabic script, although the skill seems to not have belonged to the core curriculum. The Geniza corpus, for example, contain, contains a sizable number of Arabic uh, fragments written by Jews in Arabic script. The large bulk of these uh, texts constitute administrative documents and private correspondence. Some legal documents contain contracts between a Jew and a Muslim or a Jew and a Christian. In addition, correspondence with Muslim rulers as well as trading accounts and lists are found in Arabic characters. The most modest portion by far is represented by private letters from Jews to Jews. It is therefore plausible to assume that the main uh, rationale for the use of Arabic script was an Arab or Muslim addressee. Uh, but 
There are also indications that Arabic script remained in fact also for correspondence a matter of choice um, as it becomes, for example, evident in a letter dating um, 1058 in which the author, uh, Musa bin Yaakov, expresses uh, in his letter the preference to read the answer of this letter uh, in Arabic in Hebrew script. Says the letter. So basically, here um, the, 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 the letter writer basically asks the one who is answering to please write the answer of this letter in Hebrew letters and not in Arabic. So there seems to have been at least some choice also. Um, a similar uh, rationale of a non Jewish readership may be also observed uh, regarding. Um, literary compositions by a non-Jewish, by a Jewish author. Um, Arabic script seems to have been employed more commonly in genres which address a broader general readership such, such as uh, medical science or philosophy. This holds true um, at least for the early period of Judea Arabic. Masar Jawe, um, who lived around 700, wrote his medical tractates in Arabic letters. The works of another pioneer of Judeo Arabic literature, David al Muqammas, active in the ninth century, also exhibits clear indications of original composition in Arabic script. Similarly, Yitzhak Israeli, who was active around the turn of from the ninth to the 10th century, wrote his philosophical and medical compositions in Arabic characters. His pupil, uh, Dunash ben Tamim, uh, who was active in the first half of the 10th century, continued this custom. In a treatise on the uh, armillary uh, sphere, um, which is also um, composed in Arabic script. So there's reason to believe that um, the emergence of Judeo Arabic writing as such um, is at least partially related also to the use of Arabic letters. And um, what we, we also find in some of the early Judeo Arabic um, uh, texts uh, written in early phonetic Judeo Arabic that I've just introduced, that they were actually first copied in Arabic and only later transmitted in uh, Hebrew letters. So we see that uh, in kind of uh, copying mistakes. In um, the early period of Judeo Arabic, the diffusion of texts in Arabic script of Jewish provenance appears to be wider than believed previously. At least a certain stratum of Jewish population did actually compose their works in Arabic letters. So now the case for Karai text is in contra contrast a little bit different. Uh, in the 10th and 11th centuries, describe, uh, Karai scribal circles frequently copied Judeo Arabic works in Arabic script. Um, possibly following this kind of earlier uh, custom that I've just described. Not only were large proportions of Karaite literary composition composed and transmitted in Arabic letters, but also the Holy Scriptures, but also um, portions from rabbinic and uh, literature and liturgy were transcribed from Hebrew into Arabic script. So the Karaite practice of using Arabic letters and writing is documented well in El Kekisani's Kitab al Anwar wal Maraqib, um, of which also considerable portions are also exclusively extant in Arabic script. So uh, El Kekisani composed this work at the end of the 10th century, probably in Iraq, um, and his discussion indicates that the use of Arabic script was, well ex was a well accepted custom at his time and place. He speaks in one text about uh, the question whether it is permitted to uh, read Arabic script uh, on a Shabbat, and therefore we can imply that actually texts in an Arabic script uh, were somehow studied uh, on the Shabbat. So um, it appears indeed, and now I quote uh, Chagai Ben Shammai, that uh, the use of Arabic um, is part of the cultural history of Karaism from its earliest stronghold, Mesopotamia. The custom was thereafter transmitted to the Jerusalem uh, circle of scholars um, as a result of the Karaite immigration to Palestine. It was only after the dispersal of these communities in the wake of the Crusader conquest that the use of Hebrew script became prevalent. 
many compositions of prominent members of the of that circle, such as Yefet Ben Eli, his son Levi Ben Yefet, Abul Fares Harun, David Ben Boaz, and Yeshua Ben Yehuda, uh, were penned in Arabic script. Partly, they are extant in orthographs, and usually, it's a rule of thumb that the oldest manuscripts of these compositions are always in Arabic script. Um, this custom subsequently spread to other communities that fell under their sphere of influence. For example, the communities, the Karaite communities in Egypt. This is illustrated, for example, uh, in the Karaite material and Arabic letters from the Geniza Corpus and also the Firkovich collections. Um, and also we do have uh, the autographs of uh, Ali ben Suleiman, um, whose compositions stretch over some years in the 11th century, um, and he was active in Egypt. We also know what we have previously heard about basically documents and correspondence, um, the, where we talked about the choice of, of the, the use of Hebrew script versus Arabic script being a choice. We also know that um, about producing manuscripts, um, so um, we, in an interesting document that has been published by Jeffrey Khan, who is also present today, um, a, a certain Abu Hassan Daoud bin Imran bin Libi, who was commissioned actually to copy um, um, uh, the commentary of Yeshua ben Yehuda for the education of his son, was given the choice by the scribe whether this should be copied in Hebrew or in Arabic script. So some Judeo-Arabic texts were also at a certain point transcribed into Arabic letters um, and thus disseminated also beyond Jewish communities. Um, and Saadia's famous uh, Judeo-Arabic translation of the uh, Pentateuch is maybe the, the, the best example we can bring here. It was adopted by Coptic intellectuals uh, and also um, we have uh, partly evidence about um, also um, uh, Syriac Orthodox, Orthodox branch of transmission and even a Jewish branch of uh, a Muslim branch of transmission. Um, so uh, we have certain Judeo Arabic texts that were at a certain point transcribed into Arabic script. Uh, another fine example is um, uh, the Arabic translation of Sefer Yosipon. Um, and um, actually, for Sefer Yosipon, it's very interesting because the only complete copies of this text are extant in Arabic script and of indeed Coptic provenance. We also um, know that uh, Maimonides' Guide of the Perplexed was transcribed into Arabic script. So uh, now, Slowly coming to the end of my presentation, I want to reflect a little bit on the position of Judeo-Arabic literature within the larger framework of Jewish literature. We have seen that um, the Islamic expansion, uh, expansion from the seventh century onwards had not only united the vast majority of Jewish people in one single linguistic, cultural, and political entity for the first time in many central centuries, but also inaugurated a period of great scholarly growth and an almost unparalleled blossoming among Jews. Um, now, um, it brought about, um, or it brought into being a medieval republic of letters, as it were, in Arabic, a situation that differs, differed much from the Jews under Muslim rule, as I have explained, where Jewish scholars never took part in active, never took an active part in uh, Latin uh, literacy. With Arabic, uh, really, one has to stress that uh, as a lingua franca, texts, but also innovative literary models, textual practices, and genres, as well as forms of discourse, could easily travel um, communal barriers. It is well known that, uh, that Jews were interested in Muslim and Christian Arabic literature and even transmitted some in Hebrew script. So here we have the case that actually um, non-Jewish literature in Arabic script was um, transmitted and transcribed into, into Hebrew. Um, these um, texts include the fields of medicine, astronomy, astrology, philosophy, ge geometry, meteorology, and uh, also other texts. We also have transcribed Arabic grammatical texts, um, and even parts of the Quran were transcribed. 
the presence of a wide variety of non-Jewish books is also, no also noticeable in medieval book lists and literary inventories. The impact that non-Jewish literature, be it Muslim or Christian, had on Jewish literature in Arabic is generally acknowledged in scholarship. Now let's look back uh, prior to this literary development. Hebrew and Aramaic um, texts of the rabbinic period were produced not by an author, but rather over generations of partly anonymous and collective scholarship, extending not infrequently over several centuries. Rabbinic texts uh, circulated orally and may have been also edited orally. The Gionim, the leaders of the Jewish academies, followed an oral mode of transmission and also the composition remained an act of oral study or recitation. Now as Arabic became more widely used also amongst Jews, um, writers and readers embraced new concepts of authorship that are characterized by indiv individual authorship and monothematic treatises. What do I mean by that? That, that is texts that were composed by one author uh, at one particular moment in time and intended from the very beginning to be transmitted through written copies, so, something that was not attested in Jewish literature since Hellenistic age. The transition towards writing um, uh, down oral traditions led also to a new way of structuring text compositions. Literary works were composed and redacted according to a canon of stylistic rules. This type of structure also resonates in contemporaneous Hebrew and Aramaic compositions and required an elaborate, elaborate and often playful title, a programmatic introduction that outlined the current, the content, structure and purpose of the book. Um, the author is talking to us in the first person, so um, something we don't see in rabbinic literature. Chapters had to be well crafted uh, with clear thematic transitions between sections. Moreover, rabbinic literature um, previously had been distinguished by a fabric of ongoing discourse, exposition and argument, rather than being organized um, uh, than, being, um, than being organized according to disciplines uh, as articulated branches of knowledge. With the adoption of Arabic, however, uh, among the Jewish scholars, very fixed and set disciplines of learning emerged that had no precedent in rabbinic literature, um, such as, for example, linguistic thought, uh, grammars and dictionaries, legal and calendrical compendia, theology, philosophy and exegesis, often with many subcategories. Um, also, this goes along with using a particular technical and exegetical terminology uh, in Arabic that can also be found in contemporaneous non-Jewish literature. So by this little overview, um, I wanted to introduce, to introduce to you the world of classical uh, Judeo Arabic um, a little bit um, better. And I thank you for your um, interest.